to the tenth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee uh, for 2018. We have apologies this, this morning from Alison Johnson. Can I ask everyone in the room to please make sure that mobiles are switched off or to silent? And can I also remind uh, everyone in the room not to uh, record or photograph proceedings as that will be done uh, for us by the Parliament staff. We start this morning with uh, agenda item one, which is the consideration of four uh, negative instruments. The first of these is the Duty of Candour Procedure Scotland Regulations 2018. Members will recall the Duty of Candour uh, is an issue that was raised during the uh, committee's inquiry on NHS governance. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Can I ask if any members have any comments on this instrument? If not, uh, are we agreed to make no recommendations on this matter? Thank you very much. The second and third instruments relate to the General Medical Services contract. The committee previously considered and agreed a draft approach to consideration of this contract, uh, and we agreed that following publication of the primary care improvement plans expected in July, that we would then issue a call for written views. We have also agreed to hold an oral evidence session with key stakeholders to inform us about the implementation of the contract and delivery of primary care later this year. The second instrument is the National Health Service General Medical Services Contracts Scotland Regulations 2018. Again, there has been no motion to annul. However, on th in this case, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have made comments on the instrument under general reporting ground, and they have noted a number of, of drafting errors in the instrument. Now, I know the Scottish Government has undertaken to lay amending regulations in early course to correct these errors, uh, but I wonder if any other members have any comments on these instruments. There being none, and given the commitment of the Government to correct the errors in this instrument, uh, uh, is the Committee agreed to make no recommendations on this matter? Thank you very much. The third instrument is the National Health Service Primary Medical Services Section 17C Agreements Scotland Regulations 2018. Again, there has been no motion to annul. Again, unfortunately, there has, there has been comment from the Dele Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee under general reporting grounds, noting several drafting errors in the instrument. Again, the Scottish Government has undertaken to lay amending regulations in early course to correct these errors. Can I invite any comments from members of the committee on this instrument? There being none, are we agreed that we should make no recommendations on this instrument? Thank you very much. And the fourth and final of these instruments is the National Health Service Pharmaceutical Services Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018. Uh, and again, no motion to annul and no comment in this case from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Are there any comments from members of this committee? There being none, are we agreed to make no recommendations? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you very much. That takes us uh, swiftly uh, to our second agenda item. Uh, I welcome to the committee once again the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sports, Shona Robson, MSP, and also Shirley Rogers, the Director of Health, Workforce and Strategic Change. This evidence session is on the impact of leaving the European Union on health and social care in Scotland. Members will have seen uh, the letter from the Cabinet Secretary, which was circulated with papers, but may I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Well, good morning and thank morning. you, Convener, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to give evidence on the implication of Brexit for health and social care in Scotland. We're now almost exactly a, a year away from the day on which the UK will withdraw from the EU. People in Scotland voted decisively to remain in the EU and I continue to believe this is the best option. Short of EU membership, the Scottish Government believes we should stay inside the single market and the customs union. Given the announcement yesterday, it now looks certain that progress will be made at the European Council later this week on the form and duration of a transition period and then talk should start in earnest on the future relationship between the EU and the UK. The outcome of these talks will have a major impact on economic and job prospects for current and future generations. The stakes could hardly be higher. As I said in my letter to the committee of the 24th of January, the EU does not have a huge competence over health and social care. Nevertheless, the implications of withdrawal are manifold. I outlined five key areas of concern, all already drawn to your attention and written evidence that you've received and during your oral evidence sessions, which I've been following closely. Convener, the first thing I want to make 
clear is that EU citizens currently make a, a vital contribution across the public sector in Scotland, including in our health service, where they often fill skilled vacancies and hard to recruit specialisms and geographical uh, regions, as well as in our social care sector, where they fill many vital roles. The Scottish Government has been clear that our fellow EU citizens who have chosen to live and work here are welcome. Uh, this is their home and we want them to stay. The free movement of EU nationals in the UK is curtailed as a result of the Brexit negotiations. This could have potentially serious consequences for the recruitment and retention of health and social care workers in Scotland. It could also negatively impact the free movement of medical researchers between Scotland and other EU countries, and it could affect the ability of our ac academic institutions to attract medical students to come here to study and train, impacting on the provision of health care. Convener, this government does not want any of that to happen and we've made clear that uh, with concrete policies such as guaranteeing that undergraduate tuition fees for non-UK EU students will be free for the duration of studies even after Brexit for those beginning their studies from now until the academic year 2019-20. We've also committed to looking to pay the fees of EU citizens working in the, uh, the Scottish devolved public services who wish to apply for settled status. What we need to do now is to ensure that, uh, come what may from the Brexit negotiations, Scotland is able to continue to benefit from free movement from Europe, and in addition to ensure that Scotland is able to manage international migration in a way that addresses our specific needs. This policy has been set out in detail in the recent Scottish Government paper, Scotland's Population Needs and Migration Policy. A second area of concern relates to medicines and medical devices. As the committee heard last week, with 82 million batches of medicines crossing the UK-EU border per month, any decision that results in the UK leaving the EU's regulatory regime for medicines and medical devices could have a detrimental impact across our health service. The risk is that patients might suffer as a result of slower or reduced access to new medicines and equipment. There could also be an economic impact on the pharmaceutical and medical devices industries here in Scotland. The ability to continue to operate or participate within the range of relevant EU frameworks and legislation would be in the best interests of Scotland. In our view, the best way to meet the UK government's stated commitment of continued close working and collaboration with the EU is for the UK to remain within the European Medicines Agency and to continue to secure access to the EU clinical trials portal. Withdrawing from the EMA is highly likely to be detrimental to patients. The risk is that pharmaceutical companies could be less attracted to the UK market than they will be to the larger combined states of the EU and the US, potentially resulting in delays to patients getting access to the medicines they need. We're also concerned that medicine manufacturers could be negatively impacted by additional costs as a result of having to work separately, within, with, separately with the UK. This may mean that some manufacturers choose not to do so at all. Convener, I wrote to the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, in July last year, urging him to secure the UK's continued place within the EMA. Lord O'Shaughnessy's uh, response to my letter in August, setting out the UK government's intention to continue cooperation with the EMA, was less than reassuring, given there is no example of a non-EEA country having associate membership of the EMA. Against this difficult background, I can confirm that my officials are in close and regular contact both with the Department of Health and Social Care and the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency to ensure that we are as ready as possible for any of the possible scenarios that may arise in this area as a result of Brexit. Convener, our third concern relates to those areas where we may need UK-wide common administrative frameworks if EU law is no longer applicable. There is a clear issue of principle at stake here and what might seem like rather an esoteric argument. We have always been clear <coughs> that common UK frameworks may be desirable or necessary in some areas on leaving the EU and that we would agree to them where it's in Scotland's interest, but we absolutely cannot accept the imposition by the Westminster Government of common UK frameworks, whether legislative or non-legislative, nor will we trade consent for consultation. If there are to be such UK frameworks, then Scotland must agree to them. In terms of the health and social care portfolio, there are a number of interests covered in the list of policy areas subject to discussions on UK common frameworks, which was published by the UK Government on the 9th of March. I'll mention just two of them now, with the caveat that discussions on all areas are still ongoing and that no final decisions have been taken. 
First, changes to the current UK-wide system for mutual recognition of qualifications for a wide range of healthcare professionals could have profound effects on workforce recruitment and retention on top of those I've already mentioned. My view is that cross-border recognition of professional qualifications, education and training has to continue in order to support that workforce supply pipeline. If it doesn't, we would have an immediate and serious problem post-Brexit. Second, on reciprocal health care, we also need to recognise that the rights of Scottish citizens to access state-provided health care across the EU and vice versa for EU citizens in Scotland should be guaranteed after Brexit. Some progress has been made in this area in negotiations with the EU, but uncertainty still remains. Again, my officials have been working closely with the Department of Health and Social Care and with other government departments in these areas, both in the context of the negotiations with the EU and the UK government on the possible need for common frameworks in order to ensure that Scotland's interests are fully protected. Fourthly, I'm concerned that the Brexit negotiations have created uncertainty in relation to research and, in particular, access to future EU funding and collaborative EU partnerships in areas of interest for Scotland, such as dementia and alcohol. The Scottish Government is keen to see ongoing access for Scottish organisations to EU-funded research programmes. This will be important to ensure that Scotland can continue to be at the forefront of ongoing international research collaboration. Lots of, uh, uh, loss of access to EU funding, such as Horizon 2020, will significantly impact on research in Scotland unless mitigated. It is likely that international companies will be more prone to investing in facilities, including manufacturing within the EU, which is significantly a bigger market than the UK, rather than risk tariffs and other barriers to trade. Withdrawal from the EU brings the real possibility of creating a research funding gap. Only 7% of research money allocated by the EU and European Research Council in the past decade has gone to non-member states. It is not only the scale of funding that's significant, but also the locomotive effect that resources have to drive collaboration and forge partnerships that allow our researchers to achieve more than they would alone. There is also a concern that UK partners will be given less opportunity by other collaborators due to a perception of not being fully engaged. My fifth area of concern relates to the potential consequences of future trading arrangements entered into by the UK. The process by which any such agreements are arrived at must be fully transparent. No constraints should be placed on the devolved powers of this Parliament. I have two main portfolio concerns here. First, we share the concerns that have been expressed by many that any post-Brexit trade deals the UK enters into must not open up our NHS to privatisation. On the 7th of February, the Prime Minister at PMQ specifically failed to rule out opening the NHS up to competition. This cannot be allowed to happen. Second, we do not want to see post-Brexit trade deals being allowed to compromise the many public health benefits we've realised in Scotland, such as in relation to alcohol and tobacco. In conclusion, I can confirm that our assessments and preparations for Brexit are well advanced, but they are necessarily constrained by the lack of clarity about what EU exit will finally look like. The challenge is complicated by multiple scenarios and uncertainty about the UK government's objectives. In addition, many critical issues are reserved and the responsibility of the UK government. We're seeking to mitigate some of the risks we're facing by maintaining and strengthening our relationships with EU nations, both through the consular network here in Scotland and through our office in Brussels. We're also upping our engagement with UK institutions which operate across Europe, ensuring that come what may, Scotland remains a progressive outward-looking nation. Convener, what I've presented to you this morning is by no means a comprehensive list or either of my concerns or of the actions we're taking to mitigate some of the risks we're facing, but I hope it gives you a clear sense we're alive to all of the implication and challenges of Brexit and we're doing what we can to mitigate risks we did not seek and cannot avoid. I'd be happy to take questions on all of these and indeed any other related issues. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That's most helpful. Can I start with a general question in relation to yesterday's agreement? Clearly, it doesn't uh, alter the substance of uh, many of the issues you've discussed. However, it does potentially provide a, a wider window within which to resolve some of the issues. Uh, is that the view of the government and how uh, does that impact in particular on the areas of your responsibility? I mean, I, I think you're right in your expression. It provides a, a wider window but in a period of time, but it doesn't give any additional clarity. Um, so it gives more time. Uh, but that time um, and whether that time is used uh, productively, I think, uh, remains uh, to be seen. We need to 
have certainty. Um, so yes, I think there is a, a welcome of, of having more time, but the devil will be in the detail of what that transition ends up looking like. Um, and we'll continue as I've laid out a pace to try to secure Scotland's interests within that. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, just before I ask my question, it's interesting to note that in our papers that Lord uh, O'Shaughnessy was invited to be here today to sit alongside and uh, a sustained effort was made to accommodate his attendance and he was unable to attend this meeting or various dates, uh, alternatives that were offered, as well as even video conferencing. So it's, I find that interesting that we couldn't even get another date, but thank you for being here this morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you've outlined a lot of the issues that are faced uh, as we proceed for this uh, Brexit. Um, I'm interested to know what you would like to see as a, an immediate priority or immediate action in some of the issues you've laid out and how is engagement with the UK government as this process uh, moves forward? Well, the, the reason I selected the, the five areas I did in my opening remarks, and there are others, but I selected those five because for us, those are the, the five most uh, pressing matters. Um, the issue of, of the, the movement of people is, is key here. We have uh, many EU nationals working within our public services in the here and now, and we've tried since the start of this uh, this whole process to give out a message that they are most uh, welcome here. We want them to stay, and we've tried to give um, incentives and as much security as we can, but ultimately we can't give guarantees. Um, that's not within our gift, but what we have done is, through some of the measures I um, indicated in my opening, it's given a very clear indication um, of, of our desire for them to stay. So, uh, you know, out of all of the five, the, the, the key issue uh, for me is maintaining that flow of, of people for our health and, and social care services, um, and we will continue to do whatever we can to ensure that's the case, but it's uh, very, very difficult indeed. Is there any way that the Scottish Government can um, look at uh, 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 furthering our like health and social care integration? We're already pretty advanced in that. There's social prescribing that's being developed. So these are quite uh, good approaches that are taking place. So will any of that be impeded by, by this exit from the European Union? Well, I think if you look at our health and social care workforce, I think there's a, a, a varying threat to all of that. I mean, if you look at some of the, the specialties within medicine, there are more EU nationals within some than others. So if you take uh, areas like paediatrics, for example, or surgery, there's a higher number of uh, EU nationals working within those specialties. If you take uh, dentistry in parts of uh, your uh, neck of the woods, we have, uh, I think it was over 40% in, uh, in, um, of, of dentists coming from the EU and part of that is because of the recruitment campaigns that have taken place previously and then people in encourage others to come so it has a, a, a domino uh, effect so that is going to be very very difficult and within social care you've heard from Scottish care themselves about the, the impact in the, the here and now uh, within uh, care homes uh, particularly for care staff but also for nurses within uh, care homes. Uh, that has been an important uh, flow of, of people from the EU and um, from what I've heard from Scottish Care, the recruitment agencies that they would use in Europe to recruit have essentially closed their doors because nobody was coming through them because of the perception that, you know, the, this is, uh, and, and that is the difficulty um, of perception as much as the rea reality uh, at, at the moment and people are being put off uh, coming, particularly in the social care field, uh, is a a worry indeed. So, um, you know, we will continue to, to take action to do what we've done in terms of growing our own workforce, and we've set out that within our workforce plans, and uh, we will do what we can. But, you know, we also, I think, benefit from the diversity of our workforce in health and social care here. It brings a richness to our workforce when people from, from elsewhere come to work here, and we don't want that to end. Thank you. Thank you. Ashton. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. I'm interested particularly in um, the negotiations themselves. So um, the Scottish Government, in the written evidence, you've said you're continuing to make representations to the UK Government on issues relating to health and social care. But I'm interested as to what level of involvement um, 
is there for the Scottish Government in the negotiations you know, with regard to Brexit going forward? Well, I think, as you're, you're probably aware, um, this has been a, a key uh, point of contention because uh, we have... Um, well, we've not had the ability to um, be part of the negotiations, so I guess the information we get, if we get it, is second or third hand. Uh, we're therefore not able to um, put forward our um, unique needs and aspirations uh, in the way we'd want. So if you look at, for example, the migration paper that's been written, it sets out very clearly what would meet Scotland's needs in terms of migration policy, but that would require the UK government to um, enable um, uh, the Scottish government to have some of those powers around uh, migration in order for us to um, be uh, Brexit ready and to be able to um, develop um, our migration policy that will suit our needs. Uh, we have had no indication of, of any uh, given that direction, uh, unfortunately. So we are um, in a very, very difficult position where we can see um, the impact. We know what it will be. Uh, we are trying to influence that through Europe directly and, of course, through our negotiations with the UK government. But as you've probably heard through from Mike Russell and others, that has been a very, very difficult process and not one that we found um, easy or productive. And um, unless things dramatically change, uh, then, you know, that um, unfortunately may continue to be the case. So are there, you know, in terms of intergovernmental relations, are there structures in place? You know, is there cross um, government working um, at the moment already happening, you know, to ensure that Scotland's voice is heard into these negotiations? Or are you finding that you're, you're not able to kind of input into the process? Well, there's been, um, so for example, in the UK frameworks, there's been uh, uh, some cooperation, particularly at official level, around uh, deep dives into those issues um, and attempts to, to try to uh, find common areas of agreement. But but then we come uh, to the issue of of consent and whether or not there is agreement on that. And of course, that is where there has been a divergence uh, to date uh, uh, of opinion. Uh, we believe that there can be good progress made around UK frameworks, but it has to have the consent of the devolved administrations because many of them impact on devolved areas, as I laid out in my opening remarks. And without that explicit consent, well, we would be signing up to uh, essentially uh, another place uh, deciding and, and uh, on the, 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 those frameworks um, whether or not we like it. And that's not something ourselves or the Welsh have been uh, prepared to do for, for good reasons. So, so yes, there has been an, you know, um, a lot of discussion, uh, endless amounts of discussion. But on that key point about who ultimately decides, um, that has yet to be resolved and it is so important because many of these areas are, are absolutely critical uh, as I've laid out. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That takes us to the key issue of common frameworks uh, going forward and I call Brian Whittle. Again, good morning to the panel and you've, you've touched on uh, the common framework uh, the, uh, work that's currently been done. I'm interested to know what role uh, do you think uh, the, this, this committee, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, um, may have in the development uh, and agreement in the Scottish framework uh, uh, policy? Well, I mean, I think all of our uh, parliamentary institutions, uh, you know, have should have a role, and, and obviously, you've attempted through um, trying to get um, U UK government ministers to come to to engage with that. I, I think it's an unfortunate that they've so far um, not agreed to, to do that. I think they should. Um, so I would uh, you know, suggest that there, you know, there there should be. Um, committee involvement, but I think we need to resolve the, the issue of, of consent because um, if we we can talk about frameworks, we can develop some of the, the thinking around them, but ultimately there has to be, and, and not all of it's contentious, some of it actually won't be contentious, but I think unless we can agree the principle of, of consent, that particularly around legislation that would be developed uh, to replace uh, EU legislation, it is absolutely important that explicit consent is, is given by the devolved administrations. Um, so I think that would create a better backdrop to the development of the, the UK frameworks um, and it would create a better 
uh, environment for for those to to be to be brought. We absolutely agree at the need for UK frameworks in many of these areas. It makes sense to do that, but there's there's got to be explicit consent. I think what I'm really interested in is is, is almost your input into what uh, what you think this committee uh, would be able to do in terms of if we're, if we're going to produce a report here on you know the EU withdrawal with reference to health and, and social care, what can we do? Um, and, and to aid that process um, uh, and, and, and fit into what the, the Scottish Government is doing. So I think that's one of the reasons why we're particularly asking that we maintain a dialogue between uh, yourselves and this committee in terms of progress that you're making and what, do, what, what can this committee do? Well, I think any pressure that you can bring to bear as a, a committee, whether it's this committee or any other committee in Parliament, to try to... Um, well, first of all, um, it, um, highlight some of the issues I know have collective concern around this table, which I touched on in my opening remarks. It's a, it's a concern for all of us across uh, the parties. Uh, and, and also to, uh, I would hope, um, you know, pr pursue the issue of, of the need for, for consent um, around those frameworks. We need to get that principle established so that uh, any when we get into the detail of of what will replace uh, that it is um, agreed that the the uh, agreement of ourselves and 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 the Welsh uh, administration will be required and I think as a parliament there is a role for this committee in looking at some of the the detail as it emerges but you know we've got to get that principle established which will create the right backdrop for us to to have further discussions I'm happy to keep you uh, as a committee as informed as I can as the um, the detail of, of these issues emerge um, and you know now we have this uh, this uh, additional agreement around the the transition period um, you know I'm certainly happy to, to keep the committee informed of of the discussions that we continue to have if I could just just to highlight it's also this committee's responsibility to hold the Scottish government to account and and therefore when, within within that uh, it's important that we ensure the Scottish government are conducting their uh, their, their, uh, uh, the, the way they, they conduct themselves within this negotiation as well so which is why it's really important for this committee to understand exactly what the Scottish Government are currently doing uh, in, in their interactions with the Scottish UK Government. In well, terms of I mean, as I'm sure you're aware, um, we, s we have spent and our officials across all of the areas um, of the frameworks have spent a, a huge amount of time and effort trying to uh, move things forward. The deep dive exercises and, and all of that has taken a, a huge amount of time. Um, so there's no lack of willingness um, to engage on the detail, but you know we, we can't get away from the, the principle of ultimately um, there, there has to be consent on these matters. So, uh, you know, I am, I'll make myself available as much as this committee wants me to over the next period of time as we take these matters forward to come back regularly to discuss uh, the detail. But we, um, you know, are trying to move forward on many of these issues uh, as, as much as we can. But we, have, we do come back to that fundamental issue of consent. Uh, Sandra White, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Karina, and good morning. I just wanted to come back on and uh, extend some of the, the issues that um, Brian Whittle had mentioned. I raised the, the issue of common framework in the debate last week because it is really important. <coughs> Pardon me. Obviously, professional qualifications, organ donations, uh, various things as well. Medicine prices is, is another which we need a common framework for. Um, can the, the Cabinet Secretary tell me you basically what discussions have been ongoing between the Scottish Government and obviously the Westminster Government. And it's a pity the Lord Shaughnessy isn't here. We might have been able to ask him that question. And uh, is there a date when we will hear if this is agreed or not agreed? Because I think a framework is really important to ensure that we cover these very important issues. So just an update perhaps on where we are at the moment and uh, basically when we will hopefully get an agreement on these frameworks. I mean, I think it's difficult to to give a kind of time frame, and you know, obviously we now well we have, we have time frames that are um, that are kind of set out externally that we have to to work towards. But in terms of our uh, discussions, we um, are trying our best to, to make progress on the detail. And there, as I said earlier, there are many areas of of agreement around uh, what we need to establish. 
Um, and you know, not all of that is contentious, but there will be areas that are, are more contentious than others. Uh, and there were, are areas where we would want to perhaps do things differently. Um, on the issue of uh, qualifications, um, as I set out in my opening remarks, we believe it is really important to have common frameworks around uh, qualifications. We believe that um, around the, the regulation and qualifications, having that uh, consistency allows people to, to work uh, across um, these islands, and that is, is a good thing. There are concerns about some of the um, the, and maybe Shirley can say a little bit more about this, around the, the qualifications of EU citizens coming in. And at the moment, that's a very straightforward process. If that was to change, I can assure you it is not a straightforward process. The alternatives, uh, and actually for those non-EU uh, nationals coming in, it's a, quite a, a complicated process, which we need to look at in itself, which we're attempting to do. But we don't want to lose that uh, straightforward process uh, of, of EU national uh, qualification recognition. Um, so, you know, the, the, the detail continues to be discussed. Um, we... Uh, well, are doing that in good faith. Officials are spending a lot of time on this, as you can imagine. Um, but um, you know, the, the the political point at the moment is, well, you know, if we are going to bring those frameworks to a successful conclusion and be able to agree them, um, then there has to be a, a principle of of consent uh, to any of the legislative changes that require to be made. Shirley, do you want to? Yes, um, thanks and good morning. Um, if I can bundle together a couple of, of, of questions. Um, we've been working at an official level very closely with colleagues in the Department of Health and the Home Office and various other places. And I, I meet regularly with my team and my opposite numbers um, in the Department of Health to discuss a range of issues around things like qualifications, reciprocity, pharmaceuticals, general preparedness and preparedness for uncertainty sometimes to, to try and model various scenarios and see what that might take us to. Coming to the specific issues in respect of the Cabinet Secretary's observations around the EU Directive on Recognition of Professional Qualifications, there are seven um, sets of professional qualifications um, which are um, given automatic read across across the European Union at the moment. And five of those um, are germane to the health and social care world. So that covers, in, in our world, doctors, dentists, midwives, general nurses and pharmacists. The other two just for interest are veterinary science and architects. Um, but the five that pertain to us are obviously germane to all of our workforce planning because those are five key groups for us. And, and I can assure the committee that we spend a great deal of time arguing very hard for the um, reciprocity of those qualifications to be immediately recognised. I'm happy to take any more detail on that if you wish, mm -hmm. but that assurance that those conversations are taking place is, is, is absolute. Thank you very much. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned in response to Ash Denham the issue of uh, migration and how, that would, um, uh, how significant that is in relation to these workforce issues. Uh, is that a matter that uh, comes within discussion on common frameworks going forward, given the existence already of, for example, the shortage occupation list in yeah. Scotland? And I mean, so the on. point has been put um, on every occasion, I think, that, that uh, could be that, you know, that um, referencing the Scotland's Population Needs and Migration Policy paper, um, I mean, if we had um, those powers, we could vary criteria and thresholds, um, decide what sits on Scot Scotland's shortage occupation list, um, and you know, those things matter. Um, and being able to flex the system to, to meet our needs, and those discussions are, are raised and those asks are, are made. Um, but um, to date, obviously, there's not been any... Uh, um, movement on that, so, but we will continue to to make make that case. Thank you very much. Moving on to a specific area around the research workforce and, and some of the uh, implications. Uh, they are clearly, uh, we've heard strong evidence of the challenges uh, 
that we will face in maintaining co partnerships and collaborations going forward. Can you uh, tell us what uh, specific areas you have been working on, for example, with UK government colleagues on enabling that to continue? And, and, and also, going back to my very first question, uh, Horizon 2020 clearly is, is relevant here and the, the, the wider window may have some benefits in that. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the difficulties here is and that there is a concern of um, that impacting in the here and now. There, anecdotally, you've probably heard this as well from uh, some of the, the submissions um, that people feel that there is already an impact in terms of the success of, of research uh, applications and that there's a, a kind of... Um, that over that we're over there now um and in terms of collaborations um seen perhaps as a a weak partner in those rather than, and and that matters because it impacts on decisions being made uh, now so you know we all benefit from um the research funding programs uh we are uh, making that case very very clearly both to to Europe in terms of wanting to continue to be part of that and showing our goodwill and what we have to offer and research capacity and capability and to you know keep the making the point that we're open for business still in that area and we want to be part of that and of course um, we're um, making that point very forcibly to the to the UK uh, government and continued access to funding at levels at least equivalent to those currently available under the EU programmes such as Horizon 2020 will uh, underpin research partnerships and collaborations with uh, European partners in key areas such as I mentioned dementia, uh, where Scotland is a leading partner through the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia Consortium, uh, led by a, a key academic from Edinburgh U University and supported by um, the NHS Dementia and the Neuroprogressive Disease Research Network. And, there, there's a, a risk, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, um, that diminished international competitiveness and influence of the Scottish health research sector coupled with exclusion from the networks with others in the EU may reduce the attraction of Scotland to potential partners um, to, to uh, collaborate on uh, research with. So, you know, we, I think for us, this is a really key area that needs to be, um, there needs to be, progress made um but again it's just part of the, the backdrop challenges and i think we understand how far perception and the kind of informal networks and conversations people have are influenced by their perception uh, of what the outcomes of the brexit negotiations might be but are there specific things the scottish government can do uh, to encourage and enable researchers from other eu countries to, to continue to see Scottish universities, for example, or Scottish scientists as partners uh, and to uh, provide assurance, regardless, in a sense, of, of, of the progress of the negotiations at an intergovernmental level are the things you can do to assist Scottish institutions. Yep. I mean, the, the Scottish higher education institutions have secured over 316 million euros under Horizon 2020 up to September 2017 based on the world-class research and reputation. So we continue to promote that world-class research <laughs> reputation around Europe and that those points are being made all the time about Scotland still open for business and research and we, you know, we... But I guess what I started off by saying is you can't get away from the fact that there is awareness out there in the research field, obviously, uh, about some of these programmes that are coming at a time where it might be through the transition period and beyond. Uh, and that is a difficulty for us, but we continue to absolutely promote Scotland's uh, ability, our skilled workforce, um, our reputation, and we're doing that as, as forcibly as, as we can. Um, Shirley, you want to say? Yeah, I, th I think your point as well is, is what do we do about the rest of the world that is, that is not just the yeah. EU component. And I think the, um, that leads us to some of the conversations that we're already embarked upon in terms of what migration policy might look like and where we might seek flexibilities around UK visa reg regulations beyond um, Brexit and, and how that um, allows us to attract and work with the rest of the world as well as those, those partners from Europe. So things like... 
um, discussions around the existing tier two visa arrangements, discussions around um, the kinds of visas that might apply for people in training, some of our concerns around things like the immigration skills charge and how that might be a disincentive to people coming from, from overseas and uh, um, perhaps not as effective as it might be in terms of helping us to secure a medical workforce. So the, there are a number of issues that go way beyond the re relationships with Europe. There's no doubt that the um, attractiveness of being able to have secure funding across a European basis has been, has been a concern. Brief supplementary, David Stewart. I want to commentate. Um, I'm sure the witnesses are aware that one of the positive things about research in Scotland is that Scotland's a net beneficiary from research and, in fact, has more spend per head than any of the other E28 countries. Uh, what is the Cabinet Secretary and, indeed, Charlie Rogers' view of becoming associate members of RISE in 2020? Because I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is aware that there are um, non-EU countries who are members of RISE in 2020, albeit that they're not voting members. I mean, absolutely. I think all of these... Um, possibilities um, are you know are actively being pursued I mean obviously we would want as a first um, choice to continue to be uh, uh, full members and access but obviously the looking at what those other options may be all of those um, are being explored uh, the closer we can uh, align ourselves um, the better that's why our ministers have been spending so much time speaking to the institutions within Europe including those research institutions looking at what those options might be and showing willingness to explore those options so you know please be assured that uh, and, and again happy to keep the committee updated as uh, those discussions and others are, are taken forward. Come back to research issues in a moment, but first of all, Miles Briggs will have questions thank you, on other convener, workforce and, issues. Um, thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, Cosler noted in the evidence they'd given to uh, the committee that even before taking Brexit into account, analysts and commentators foresee, foresaw significant challenges for all sectors. Um, specifically, I wanted to to look towards where the Scottish Government are seeing um, Scottish homegrown medical professionals. And I wondered if you could outline, in terms of the workforce planning we've seen over the last decade, um, where you see changes such as within um, the social care workforce and within the medical schools in Scotland to actually meet these future demands. Um, so, um, since uh, 2016, there's been uh, 190 medical school places um, added um, and uh, you know, we have continued to expand uh, medical education, not just the undergraduate, but obviously with the new uh, graduate level uh, medical school um, that is um, opening its doors this year is to um, build more resilience and robustness around um, our own, uh, growing our own workforce. So. Uh, we have taken those steps, uh, also uh, expanding um, training places, uh, looking at nursing and midwifery, uh, a commitment to 2,600 additional training places by the end of this parliament. Um, and we've, um, in terms of the social care workforce, set out uh, plans to try to um, make social care as a career more attractive. And the workforce plan <coughs> sets out a number of uh, mechanisms and, and ways of doing that. So I mean, we're, we're doing all of that, but um, you know, I think we also have to recognize that we benefit enormously from people who come to study here, uh, make their home here, contribute to our public services. And you know, that in itself is a, is a, a very rich seam of, of talent and experience that we don't want to lose. So yes, we'll take steps uh, and are taking steps to, to grow our own workforce, but uh, we, 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 we will benefit uh, from people coming here, not just for numbers of people working in our public services, but there's also all of the, the cultural benefits that we, we get um, uh, from, from people uh, coming uh, and working here. 
Uh, also, our medical schools have an international reputation since they were established. Um, we have more medical schools per head of population than anywhere else uh, in the UK. And uh, part of the benefit of that has been the fact that they have an international reputation and people want to come and study at those medical schools. So many of them stay. Um, some uh, 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 go back to their, their home countries, but you know, without a doubt, our medical education system is, is world renowned, and we want to m make sure it remains so. Thank you. On, on that medical school point, the number of Scottish domiciled medical students has gone down by 12% mm -hmm. since 2000. Now, that's a, a decision as well around capping the number of Scottish domiciled students which are available. So, we now only see 51% of medical graduates being Scottish domiciled um, in 2000, it was 63%. Will you look towards lifting that cap then, given what you said in terms of growing the medical workforce and, and projecting the need? And a second point around adult social care staff, and I think that's where we've taken a lot of uh, soundings on for our report. How many adult social care staff do you see Scotland needing uh, because of Brexit and, and what's happening to make sure that the college sector are, are helping to um, foresee those posts? So, um, I mean, first of all, you know, universities have always had the ability to recruit their, uh, their, um, to their medical places um, freely. Um, and that, as I said earlier, because we have five medical schools, uh, has been important in being able to ensure that they uh, continue to do that and are world leading and are seen as international medical schools. But in terms of expanding, the, the places, one of the reasons we have done that, by, and as I, said, as I started off by saying since 2016, I had 190 uh, medical school places uh, have been added with very much the intention of creating more opportunities for Scottish domicile students. You'll also see from the graduate medical school programme that we have offered bursaries uh, in re um, response to a commitment to working in the NHS, no matter where someone comes from, frankly, it's about them wanting to work in the NHS. Uh, that's our, our motivating factor. Um, and therefore, that o offers an opportunity for uh, for people to, to commit to the NHS. And we believe that, that many will do so. Do you want to say? Yeah, um, it also relates to Mr Whittle's question about what the committee can do, and I think sometimes having some granularity on the evidence is, is helpful. So if we take the 1,177 doctors in 2017 that were European primary medical qualifications, so those, those people who qualified for medicine in another part of the European Union, um, at the moment the dispersal across our specialties is quite uneven. And that, I think, becomes very important when we're looking at the impact of withdrawal on the EU. So if I take those categories, those specialisms that have the highest proportion, those are things like general medicine, emergency medicine, anaesthetics and inst intensive care, occupational medicine, ophthalmology, paediatrics, pathology, radiology, surgery. One of the things that we've been able to do is to nuance our training places in those specialties. So, for example, if I take paediatrics as an example, rather than training one paediatrician for every paediatrician that we think we're going to need, in order to look at the, and to reflect the changing nature of the workforce, we now train 1.6 for one. So there are a number of things that we can technically do to try and encourage places, students to go into places to train for specialties that we particularly want to see. So it's not simply a matter of saying we want to have an overall increase in the numbers. We want to target that on those specialties that we need. And clearly, from those of you who've sat around the committee table for a while, will recognise that that list is not dissimilar to the list that we want to see expanded numbers on in terms of our workforce plan in any event. So things like paediatricians, radiologists and so on are areas that we want to grow. Turning to the healthcare um, support work and social care question. I think the migration policy becomes very critical in that space, not just in terms of the EU, but across the world around having something that, of course, is points-based to recognise highly technically incompetent people in, who come from a, from a medical or other background, but in also giving us access to people who don't. And we want to be able to attract people who have high degree of skill and not. 
But again, coming back to the things that we've actually done, the introduction, for example, of through, through training to grow our own healthcare support workers in a program which was um, developed in conjunction with SSSC and NHS Education for Scotland that allows us to take people who have virtually no educational qualification and train them through to a professional level in respect of healthcare and, 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 and social care. The numbers of those are growing every year. And also one of the areas we're also looking at is having a, a clearer pathway uh, for people who've come in through that route who might want to go on to a regulated profession and that they should be able to have a clear line of sight towards that and more flexibility. Um, so uh, you know, we're very much looking at that. The workforce plan set out a lot of the detail around how to elevate um, social care as a, a career choice and the, the marketing around that and so on. So there's a lot of detail set out about what, what we're doing to, to um, you know, which we, we, you know, we would want to do anyway, but in the light of, of Brexit, it makes it e even more sharper given the the evidence from Scottish care around the reliance uh, on, particularly for nurses uh, working within nursing homes. I should also add that one of the things we've been exploring working with Scottish care around is the idea of potentially NHS nurses providing input into to nursing homes uh, where it's been very, very difficult to recruit and they're having to pay exorbitant exorbitant uh, agency costs, which is not sustainable. Um, so we're looking at that, and I think the Fries and Galloway is going to be one of the first areas that we're trialling that. So please be assured we are trying many and varied things uh, to try and make the, the professions more attractive. From Miles Briggs' uh, uh, questioning, I brought this up at a previous, uh, a previous session that uh, it just so happened that, that I had a couple of people come into my um, uh, surgery saying that they had the qualifications to get into medical school but couldn't get in because the places weren't available. And I just wondered whether there's been any research done into other the, the number of people perhaps that were in that situation uh, uh, and potentially whether that, that is a resource going forward uh, that uh, is yet to be tapped into. Well, uh, one of the issues we've done a lot of work around is is around uh, widening access to, to medical schools. You probably be aware, as I am, that actually when you look at the, I think there's 11 suitably qualified applicants for every one um, place. Um, and there's then, of course, the beyond the qualifications, the, the issues and... Um, that have come into play around who gets the place and who doesn't quite often around how people perform an interview perhaps their work experience and if you have relations working in medicine you're more likely to get in to medical school because you've been able to access that that circle uh, and and that workplace experience which other uh, people might not have been able to so the widening access program which Shirley's been very <coughs> involved in excuse me has been looking explicitly around how to make sure that um, people get a, a better chance of securing those, particularly from um, more deprived backgrounds. There's been the pre-med year that's been very successful, um, and I met some of the young people that had taken part in that from a wide variety of backgrounds. So again, that's all about trying to make sure that everybody gets a fair crack at the whip in terms of being able to access uh, medical education and I think it's showing some some yes, signs absolutely. of success. The pre-medical pre course was introduced in 2017 and was was full with 40 pre-med students. Um, the early indications of those of those students is that they are likely to go on either to medicine or to some other healthcare related science qualification. So we're, we're optimistic about that. So you, sorry, just if, if, you, if there's a, you're saying there's 11 applications for every one place there is an untapped resource there potentially. Well, yeah, and but the issue I think is is about well, out of the eleven, why is it that uh, quite often young people from more deprived backgrounds, even though they've got the the hires, they tick all the qualification boxes, why is it that they have been less successful in securing a place? And I think the research and evidence shows that it's the wider uh, application process, so the interview, for example, the wider work experience that that person might or might not have had uh, within a, med a medical environment. So, you know, and you can see why if you have. Um, 
if you're from a, a family where there's there's uh, people within medicine already, you're more likely to be able to put that on your CV than not. So the pre-med course tries to level the playing field and it gives those young people without any access to those uh, the, to those supports uh, an opportunity to to be able to to get that experience prior to going to. If, if I might, these are important questions, but I'm keen that we. Press we on can with provide the, the committee with more We will return to this, I'm it. sure, at some point, but uh, on, there are some specific Brexit points we still want to cover in the time we have. Emma Harper. Remote and rural, yes. Um, when uh, Joanna MacDonald gave evidence, uh, she's from NHS Highland, she talked about the challenges that Brexit would bring for the remote and rural areas as well. So she talked about how the central belt is a draw for uh, people going into education or medical school. So I'm interested to know about what the Scottish Government can do to promote or help the remote and rural areas. Um, I, I, it would be interesting to hear a wee bit more about the graduate uh, entry to medical school as well. Um, I just spent the weekend at Wigtown and Port William and Newton Stewart and people say these areas might as well be islands as well because you know, they are very rural. So I'd be interested to hear about that. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the examples I, I gave earlier on was the issue of, of dentistry um, and the fact that you know, we, we have potentially a huge challenge where the success of our recruitment uh, uh, campaigns, because there was a time, um, not the case now, but there was a time where there was a, an acute shortage of, of qualified dentists and therefore there was a, a European recruitment campaign that was very, very successful, particularly in our rural areas, both in the, the Dumfries and Galloway borders and the Highlands, where many EU uh, dentists have come to work and have stayed and have encouraged others to do so. So we need to be very alive to those pockets of, of success, but now particular challenge. So there's been very direct engagement with those professionals around trying to encourage them, obviously, to stay. Many of them have brought their families up here and they want to stay. So that's a, a very acute example. In terms of what we're doing around uh, remote and rural, the the Graduate med Medical School, Scott Gem, you'll be aware that uh, the rural health boards have been very uh, proactive in securing um, uh, training uh, opportunities within their areas. So uh, down in, in your patch, uh, Dumfries and Galloway have been um, quick off the mark and have provided um, a commitment to take a number of trainees uh, from the graduate medical school um, in general practice particularly. That will make a huge difference, I think, not just in terms of the numbers of trainees, but the fact that they'll get the experience of working in remote and rural Scotland and will hopefully want to therefore do that on uh, on uh, uh, qualification and uh, once they've finished their training. Um, so I guess all of the areas that we I've laid out in terms of the, the impact and Shirley touched on some of the specialties that we draw from the EU and are harder to fill. You know that's just exacerbated and highlighted more within rural and remote Scotland. So, you know, we will continue to do what we can with the the trainees. So, in radiology, for example, we're expanding the number of of trainee places, uh, and we're trying to ensure a spread of those, um, particularly in those areas such as the north of Scotland, where there's been particular uh, challenges in recruitment. Can I, can I just amplify some of the comments from the Cabinet Secretary there? Uh, I mean, one of the issues that we need to face in the, in the dispersal of how we train across Scotland is that you have experienced a different kind of medicine in remote and rural Scotland than you do in the Central Belt. So you don't have big teaching hospitals where you go to do you know, heart-lung transplants in those locations. So it is about how we value general practice and put a parity of esteem around general practice. It's for that reason that the design of Scott Gem, for example, not only incorporates work from the University of the Highlands and the Islands, but also has a huge focus around general practice. So if, if historically medical schools designed medics that were des destined for specialties, our view is that general practice is in itself a bit of an oxymoron, but nonetheless a specialty. So it's really important that we invest in that space. Graduate medical schools um, are designed to focus around those people who've already been through one kind of 
degree qualification, a bit more settled in their lifestyle, choosing to live and work in a particular location. And that's the other aspect that I just wanted to pick up on. All of the evidence that we've got about people from wherever they come around the world who want to live in rural Scotland are doing that because they're making a lifestyle choice around that and wanting to locate their families in rural Scotland and experience the lifestyle benefits of living and working in rural Scotland. So uncertainty about whether or not they can continue to do that is a really big issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just before we move back to research questions, uh, Shirley Rogers mentioned a specific uh, a specialism where there had been a calculation done on, 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 on who, how many people you need to train. In terms of the social care workforce, in terms of the nursing workforce, and in, in general, in terms of healthcare, what is the scale? How many people do we need to plan to recruit in order to compensate for the likely loss of many of our European Union? Well, accounts? one of the reasons we expanded uh, the nursing midwifery training places to the commitment of the 2,600 by the end of this parliament was very much with an eye um, on Brexit and, and other challenges, the need to expand uh, that workforce. Also, the fact that the, the nur nursing workforce is expanding anyway in terms of the roles that they are taking on. Also, when we're looking at the multidisciplinary team in, in the primary care, we need more nurses uh, for that. So uh, we've tried to calculate in terms of, of as best we can in, in terms of expansion of training places, a big commitment, it's a £40 million uh, commitment to uh, to, to grow that, that workforce, which will hopefully also help to, to mitigate uh, uh, against uh, Brexit. In terms of the, the social care workforce, um, again, we are, you know, the workforce plan lays, lays out the, 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 the scale of the challenge. I mean, we have um, a need to uh, really encourage many more people to uh, work within social care. The workforce plan sets out how we're going to work to change the perception of social care, um, how we're going to attempt to recruit, create more career opportunities, clear uh, pathways to, um, for example, regulated professions. Um, and do we need to do all of those things to, to grow the workforce. I appreciate you may not have numbers to hand, but perhaps Charlie Rogers would uh, I, assist. I can supply some numbers. In 2017, there were 762 EU qualified nurses um, operating nurses and midwives operating in the NHS in Scotland, which was approximately 1.76%. So we would need to, to stand still to increase by that kind of factor. The data that we have around um, the social care workforce is a little bit more um, fragmented for obvious reasons, but just to put some quantum around it in terms of the social work sector, specifically social work, 4.4% of the social work cohort are EU um, qualified with a further 2.4% from other parts of the world, not the European Union. So 6.8% in total of non-UK residents qualified in social work in that space. And the estimates that we have from this, the social independent care home sector is approximately 8%. So it would, it would need to reverse by approximately those percentages in order to stand still. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. On uh, research funding, uh, Jenny Gilruth. Convener and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and to Shirley Rogers for coming to speak to us this morning. Um, I want to maybe start a bit about looking at public messaging, and I know we've touched upon this previously, but in last week's evidence session, um, I raised the UK government's chief whip's intervention uh, when he wrote to uh, every UK university regarding the teaching of Brexit and having names of those who, who were delivering the syllabus. I think that sent a pretty clear message and I've got to say as well that Lord O'Shaughnessy not even bothering to turn up today or to respond to the committee's request uh, also sends a pretty clear message in terms of how this parliament is seen within the negotiations. But anyway, in response to my question last week, Professor Anna Dominicak told an upsetting story of being asked after Brexit, the Brexit vote by a colleague uh, if she would now go home and, and home has been Scotland for the last 36 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I posed a question to her last week if we were in danger of losing our academic edge post-Brexit and I wondered what your view might be on that, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I know Anna uh, very well and she's a, a great asset uh, to us um, as uh, are many of our colleagues and uh, she works extremely hard to promote uh, Scottish research and has been ex uh, incredibly successful in uh, bringing 
uh, huge, huge amounts of, of research opportunities to Scotland. So she's a, a real credit to us. Um, and, you know, it saddens me um, that um, uh, I think some of the unfortunate, the, the backdrop um, to, to some of this, and I think we've seen it with uh, some of the recent uh, statistics about, uh, you know, perhaps a rise in intolerance uh, to, and comments and uh, racism towards uh, people um, from uh, the EU on the back of, of leave, I think is, is sad, upsetting, abhorrent, not where we want to be, not the kind of Scotland we want to be. We're not immune from that. And we've all heard incidences, whether it's from Anna or from others, which um, is a very, very sad uh, fallout from this. And we have to work very hard to make sure we continue at every opportunity to give the message that Scotland is a, an outward looking, welcoming nation. We want people to come and work and make their homes here, as Anna has done for many, many, many years and has encouraged others to do so. So, you know, we feel extremely strongly about that. And, you know, that message that we can all give out, I think, is very important to reassure people like Anna that actually that comment is a very much a minority view and, and not, not the view shared by uh, the vast majority uh, of, of people here. Uh, in terms of what we can do about it, I think I said earlier on around the, you know, the welcoming nation, but also the fact that we have a, a very kind of hard edge to that of wanting to ensure that we continue to keep those uh, that dialogue open with EU institutions and research institutions. We have a lot to offer here. We stand on our own merits in many respects in terms of what we have to offer in the research world. Those skills are often not found uh, uh, elsewhere, whether that's in the life sciences or in uh, um, or, or the growing data um, uh, skill set that we have here in Scotland. But we, you know, we're going to have to work hard to keep that message out there uh, and to counter some of the negativity that has grown up around this this whole issue. Can I just pick up on the messaging thing? Because I think that reassurance is terribly important and the nature of Scotland as an inclusive society is in ter terribly important. But I think people are also looking for certainty. So I, I was speaking to a couple who happened to be consultants um, in one of our health boards only as recently as yesterday, I was hearing tell of them already deciding to go and move to North America. Because whilst they've enjoyed their training here and they enjoy working here and they're quite happy here, they know what they have to do in order to be able to stay somewhere. And they're at the stage in their lives where they want to think about having a family. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the messaging is terribly important. But actually, these are people who want to make lives in a place. So they need to know that they can do that with some, whatever the rules are, yeah. knowing what they are. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think we've tried, to, as I laid out in my opening speech, tried to give, you know, incentives around saying, you know, that we would, uh, you know, if anybody who wants to apply for settled status, we would pay the fees that, you know, around um, making sure we continue to pay tuition fees um, um, and, and so on gives a real message. But, you know, I, I should have also mentioned, I thought Peter, Dr. Peter Benny's comment was spot on, which uh, um, he gave in, in evidence when he said that the Scottish Government has been clear that it wants to protect the rights of European NHS staff. And this is welcome and appreciated by many, but it is ultimately the Westminster Government that must act before further damage is done. And I think that is captures both what Shirley and myself have said about, yes, we can put the message out, but, you know, we need action to end the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Sandra. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener. There were a couple of questions I wanted to touch on uh, in regarding the research workforce. I concur with everything that Jenny Gilruth has said and also the, the Cabinet Secretary as well uh, in regards to retaining and then making sure people want to come here. It was raised earlier on about um, a cap, but there's also a, a current cap in the number of non-EU residents who are able to come here uh, and, and work uh, in the UK as well. Are we looking at anything in that respect? Yeah. Can, I, 
Can I just, there was a point that I wanted to go back to Mr. Whittle's question earlier on in respect of numbers of medics in training, because I'm sure that if I was sitting in your seat thinking, well, there are lots of applicants and we only take a certain number of them, why don't we just take more of them? Um, the last time we looked at the evidence, there was about 47% of our medical establishment are currently doctors in training. So we always have to balance the issues about making sure that those doctors in training are getting a good medical education, and that relies on our consultant workforce to do that. So those of you who know medical education well will know that, that some of it is spent in the classroom, but an awful lot of it isn't. An awful lot of it is spent on the wards. An awful lot of it is spent as being supervised by our consultant and senior training workforce. So there's always a balance to be had. We couldn't simply say, even if there was all the money in the world and all the interest in the world, that we're going to have you know, an extra 10,000 doctors arriving tomorrow because there wouldn't be the process in place to give them a good quality education and well-supervised educational practice to ensure patient safety. So we're always open to suggestions about how we can increase our supply into our medical professions. We're always looking to do that. There is a, a model that the universities use in terms of those places that are funded through Scotland, those places that are funded through the rest of the UK, and those places that are funded through the rest of the world. And the universities have discretion to move somewhere along that line. We've particularly funded um, and targeted funding, uh, funded access places to Scots domicile students, but it isn't for us to tell Edinburgh University that it can't take X number or Y number, but by the same token, trying to encourage people from Scotland to go into Scottish medical schools, terribly important. But um, was uh, in regards to the, to the cap on non-EU students, uh, basically, uh, non-EU researchers coming here. Uh, is it something the Scottish Government can look at, or is this a, a UK-wide...? Well, it comes back to the visa situation. I mean, again, the migration policy sets out that we would like to have more flexibility around that to be able to, uh, for the, 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 the shortage um, uh, of skills list, short um, occupation skills list, to be able to have more discretion over that. We have tried to forge some of our own uh, initiatives on the, um, not so much on the research side, but on the, the medical training side. So for example, the medical training initiative, uh, which is an opportunity for people who are at the end of their training, so they're in the last two years, to come and finish their training here. So we've been discussing with uh, Malaysia, for example, who have a similar medical education Pro, uh, uh, set up that uh, we would take, particularly those specialties that are hard to fill, we would take some of the, the, um, their uh, trainees to finish their training. And these are people with a, you know, a high level of skill, they're at the end of their training, so they're really worth their weight in gold. So we are looking at how we would, uh, beyond Europe, uh, create these opportunities. Um, and you know, it may be in the research space. And of course, some of the discussions we would be having with some of our, um, uh, our, our ministers when they're going out to speak to um, to uh, their counterparts in uh, countries where we've been targeting um, um, around our international engagement, research would be very much at the, the top of the list in terms of trying to forge uh, new interest and new new businesses, new alliances, new investment. So it's you know, Europe is absolutely critical, but you know we have got other plans and engagement across the world where we've been trying very very hard to bring. Uh, jobs to bring research uh, here to Scotland and to, to forge those links. We can furnish you with more information if that would be helpful. We have, we have other members who, who wish to ask about this topic, but we'll maybe come back to that if time allows. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would like to do is make sure we don't miss some of the other key issues. Uh, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, Shirley. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, one of the things, the areas I'd not considered, and I don't, doubt perhaps other members of the committee had done, was the impact of leaving the European Union on clinical trials. Um, we understand, obviously, that when you've got particularly ultra-orphan conditions where there are too few patients for a sustainable clinical trial in Scotland, that we look to pan-European trials um, to, to kind of cover that. And the shocking reality of this, and I think uh, my colleague Jenny Gilruth mentioned the testimony of 
uh, Dame Anna Dominicak, and I would like to do so too, because she actually uh, referenced it as being almost criminal should Scottish patients be ripped out of European clinical trials. So um, can the Cabinet Secretary explain what representations have been made in, uh, in as much as there have been discussions with the UK government about a future Brexit trade deal, that we are part of some kind of continuing clinical trial agreement, um, and what mitigation can we put in place to uh, reduce the impact on Scottish patients so they're not deprived of potentially life-saving therapies? Hi, you, you raise a, a, a hugely important point. Um, I mean, the, the UK government's stated commitment is to continue close working and collaboration with the, the EU, um, and and they they want uh, they've said that they want um, you whether that's the, the European Medicines Agency or EU clinical trials portals, that they want to continue to um, have close working. But what does that mean? <laughs> um, I think I, we want access to um, the EU clinical trials portal. Um, I mean, you can you can ask for for the for the moon and say you you know you you want to do this and you would want to, but but actually making it happen is another matter. So I think anything short of um, having access to the EU clinical trials portal will be a, a disaster. Um, we absolutely need to um, secure that. Now we have been working hard around these issues, both with the UK government and you know. There, you're not going to get much disagreement, I would suspect, from the Department of Health uh, or potentially Jeremy Hunt himself. But that, that you know, he's not one of the key Brexit negotiators, um, and therefore, um, you know, we need to make sure that this issue is is up there. Um, Mike Russell's been well briefed about it. He knows the importance of both the access to EMA and to the uh, EU clinical trials portal. We continue to uh, highlight its crucial uh, importance um, and we have done that directly to Europe as well by saying and, and making it very clear Scot Scotland's desire to continue to, to, to be part of that. However, you know, there, as I said in my opening remarks, there um, is limited um, experience of of countries who are uh, not part of the uh, EEA somehow you know, might be described as having their cake and eating it. Um, and I think that's the difficulty. So, you know, we need to use every lever we have uh, to secure um, continued access. We have a lot to offer. Um, you know, Scotland's uh, ability to in this area in terms of clinical trials and 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 offering um given our unique selling points of our nhs uh, is is well i think well understood um however um you know it is one on a, a list of many very critical issues um but <clears throat> without it i think you're right about ultra orphan medicines that we would need that wider uh, access to to patient uh, information to be able to test these ultra orphan drugs will require access to that portal. Thank you, because um, it strikes me this is a world away from the um, discussions in trade around dealing cars for whiskey and and the rest of it. This is lives will depend on this. Um, is the Scottish government in a position then, while these arrangements are being ironed out, uh, to keep pace with the European Clinical Trials Directive through um, making sure our standards are mirroring those of Europe so that we are ready to re-engage if, if we are ripped out of it? Um, and are, are there any sort of other international trials networks that we could partake in if Europe was closed off to us? Yes, I mean, there are other international clinical trials and we do take part in them. I mean, a lot of these are, are now, you know, through use of technology, are, are able to, you know, uh, be done quite far and wide. So, yes, we are making right to the committee with, with more information on that. Um, well, <clears throat> I mean, I guess in terms of aligning, absolutely we want to align, and that would be our intention. But um, obviously the UK framework um, discussions are, uh, are part of this in that we would want to, uh, what would make most sense is for us to agree um, UK-wide to align and to uh, adopt um, uh, uh, those uh, 
those uh, frameworks to adopt those uh, um, those regulatory um, and and high level uh, and very well understood um, uh, commitments and quality assurance that is so so important. Um, but um, again, we you know I guess all of that is caught up in. Uh, the issues that we've discussed earlier on about the frameworks and the need for us to agree those um, and to agree those freely uh, across these islands. So discussions continue. Thank you very much. Uh, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, uh, good morning. Um, can I raise the issue of medicines and treatment? And Cabinet Secretary, you obviously touched on that uh, in your uh, opening statement. I've been very interested and very concerned about the future for medical isotopes. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be well away from our own knowledge in last week's evidence. The UK produces no medical isotopes, and we're part of your atom, uh, which regulates import and export. And just for completeness, 90% um, of the production of medical isotopes in the world come from four EU countries and Australia and South Africa. Um, obviously, there's huge concerns about medical isotopes because they're used, as you know, to prevent surgery and uh, lack of security supply will mean um, a, a problem with longer waiting lists and more costs and, ironically, more surgery as well. We don't have these medical isotopes. Um, what assessment have you made for the effect on cancer patients in Scotland for leaving your atom? Yes, um, again, there's been specific work done around this and I'm happy to write to the committee with, with the detail, but it is a huge, a huge concern. And actually, you're, I'm really glad you raised it because um, you can imagine um, the you know, delay, if there was, around uh, at customs points of uh, these medical isotopes being caught up in, in delays at the border and not being able to, that would have a huge uh, impact on treatment. Um, and it's not easy to secure other um, supplies of medical isotopes. It's a very uh, particular uh, product and it, obviously the transportation of it, uh, we have, um, you know, it has to be done in a, in a particular way and has to be done safely. So um, that, uh, again, has been uh, an issue that has been raised uh, by officials, by Mike Russell and his discussions with me uh, directly as well. And again, it, you know, we need clarity. We raise those issues. We talk about the impact. Um, and it would be an impact across the UK, not just on, on Scotland. Um, but we have yet to get a, a clear uh, route to resolution. So, um, you know, it is one, it is a particular concern. You can imagine, you know, there would be real concern about any goods and services being delayed in terms of, of custom points. But with this, that could impact, as you say, absolutely in the here and now on, on patient treatment and can't be allowed to happen. So, again, it would be one of these issues as discussions move forward. I would be happy to keep the committee updated on, on the detail and progress that we make. Um, Your government um, has a risk register for potential yeah, threats, yeah. and I'm sure it's just a comment rather than a question. Um, I'm sure you add to your risk register the fact that they have a short uh, half life Absolutely. and they can't be stored. So yeah, so if they're kept at the border yeah. um, because of uh, you know uh, uh, customs, if that's what emerges, um, then you can see very clearly how, how that would impact. So yes, it is uh, high up on the, the risk register. Uh, again, you know, happy to, to keep the committee informed statement about um, the leaving the European uh, Medicines Agency. Um, what's your assessment of the effect of that and how realistic is it becoming an associate member? Well, I think, as I said in my opening remarks, there's no precedent um, for um, becoming an associate member for non-EEA, as I'm aware. So, you know, again, it's uncharted territory, um, but uh, that's not something that's that's been done. I mean, I guess the, the issue would be, and uh, you'll have heard the pharmaceutical industry raise this very, very uh, forcibly, that there is an under, understood quality assurance here where standards are clear. Um, and if there was to be um, a, a development of a, of a UK alternative to that, let's just uh, say for argument's sake, um, there would be 
potentially questions about the quality assurance of that. Is it going to be pegged to the EMA? Will it have the same standards? I think those are questions that yet remain unanswered. Um, and how widely understood would that be by international pharmaceutical companies who well understand the standards of the EMA, but they might not understand this new thing that people are telling them is pegged to EMA, but is it? We don't know. And I think there are huge risks there because the pharmaceutical industry can go anywhere. It can, um, you know, and and so whether that's in investment, whether it's in terms of the um, of, of clinical trials, whether it's just of access to medicines, we need to have standards that are internationally understood. And that is in my view, best served by by the EMA because everybody understands them. Um, so, again, we continue to discuss these. It is one of the areas that we've been discussing around the framework. Surely we might have more detail on that. I was just going to amplify the Cabinet Secretary's comments by talking about licensing as well because the supply of something and us able to get that in a timely way is one thing. The cost of things and their licensing arrangements across different countries so if we look at some of the biological drugs currently available, there are different pricing regimes in different countries depending on where they are in their license cycle. So there are drugs which are considerably more expensive when sourced from elsewhere. There may also be some drugs that are cheaper from when sourced from elsewhere, but the, the majority of new biologicals and things like that are still considerably under license, and it would be, it'd be very dependent on cost and what those licensing arrangements became. I'm conscious of time. Can I move on to receptacle uh, healthcare Please. with the convener's permission? Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that there's two main positive cards uh, for being part of the EU and the EEA, which is the EHIC card, the European Health Insurance card, which all citizens can access, gives you um, the same rights of any other citizen in the 28, and just for completeness, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, and a few others. And the S1 uh, arrangement, which provides free or low-cost healthcare for those in receipt of a, a state pension, which obviously is crucially important if you decide um, to, to move from Edinburgh to Italy, Spain, or one of the other uh, EU countries. Um, just one example, um, it also provides great advantages to those with medical problems. Um, for completeness, 29,000 dialysis patients in the UK are able to go, to go abroad. If they didn't have this access, clearly there'd be huge uh, medical insurance costs which might not allow them to go. So the main uh, issue I want to raise is, again, talking about risk registers, if the S1 arrangement doesn't come to fruition, there's a transitional arrangement uh, immediately, um, what would happen uh, uh, in terms of Scots who are living abroad, who are on pension age, coming back to Scottish healthcare to access primary care, social care and care homes? Have you worked out and done some estimates, Government Secretary, of the possible impact this could have on your, your budget and your hard-pressed frontline staff? Well, I mean, if you were to take the total uh, of, of Scots of pensionable age living in Europe, but if they were all to come home at the same time, then of course that would have a, a, a huge impact. I, say, I guess human, human behaviour isn't quite like that. So I suspect that uh, we will... Well, first of all, we would hope that there will be uh, reciprocal arrangements that will finally be um, worked out and agreed because um, I, I don't think it's in anybody's interest to see uh, that scenario uh, and people who have lived ab abroad for many, many years and have made their lives, uh, whether it's on the Spanish costas or, a or anywhere else, uh, we, we would want to um, try to reach uh, agreement and um, we would expect the, the UK uh, to be uh, working very hard. We know that this this has been a, a key priority to try to get those reciprocal arrangements. Um, so we would um, want to make sure uh, that, uh, however, we would obviously be doing the work to assess any flow of people who would want to return. Um, we are not, in, at the moment, getting any indications of a kind of mass flow back from the Spanish costas. Um, I think people are waiting to see what transpires. They're probably picking up messages that this has been a, a priority uh, area uh, for the UK government in terms of guaranteeing uh, reciprocal uh, um, rights. Um, the, 
the S2 scheme and the S1 scheme, as you've uh, um, set out, bring considerable benefits uh, of, of people being able to travel. Um, and I would want to, uh, I would hope that there will be something that will be part of the transition period agreement in that space. Um, Again, I suppose the, the worry is the uncertainty at the moment. We don't know, but we know it is a, a priority that has been uh, discussed. And uh, we would want to uh, our citizens to continue to have access to those rights uh, following the UK's withdrawal from the EU. But people need to see the detail, and we need to begin to see that detail emerging. But I don't think there's going to be a, a mass um, uh, flow back to... To, to Scotland uh, overnight from people living elsewhere, but I think it is a risk if people don't have certainty that people will begin to make decisions about their futures. I said to me, well, I've seen Brexit and the NHS report by the UK and a change in Europe, which was provided to the committee, which is an excellent report, and as you know, it's an independent report. The figures that that suggests is that there's 190,000 UK citizens over 60 living abroad, and that if they came back, we would need 900 more care beds. Do you recognise these figures? Yes, um, we do. Um, I think uh, I and, and it is a, a key concern. Um, I would hope, though, that we what we you know that there would be, as I say, um, agreements put in place um, before that. Uh, but I, again, people need certainty. I think at the moment, if you're sitting as a, someone who has retired to enjoy the the sun somewhere, you'll be worried about what the, the future. Holds, um, and that's why we need certainty now before people begin to start making decisions uh, around where they're going to to locate themselves. Um, but you know, frankly, if if everybody did decide in the event of no arrangements being made, then it would have a, a huge impact on our health and care services. Question: I'm conscious of time, convener. Um, the final issue is that I'm very concerned about the effect it may have on those who are ill, those who are have got uh, long-term illness or our elderly will, will be restricted going abroad because the reality is without the uh, EHIC card, um, health insurance will be beyond them, particularly those of a lower income. Uh, absolutely. Um, that is uh, undoubtedly th the case. And we know already that some people have, have issues with uh, securing health, health insurance if they ha have... Um, um, so, um, if they already have a, a long-term condition uh, or are, are acutely unwell. So I uh, would be very concerned about that. I think those arrangements um, benefit both um, our own citizens travelling, but they also benefit citizens travelling here. Uh, and they're a sensible set of arrangements that um, will need to either be kept in place or will in some way have to be replicated. I can't see how we would be able to um, operate our, our systems without that being in place. And as I said at the beginning, I would hope that that will be uh, something that will be um, resolved. Um, if it's not, we are le leaving ourselves open to the huge impact on our citizens, both those who are here and wish to travel, but also those who are living abroad who wish to remain um, living there. And our final area of questioning, Ivan Mickey. Thank you, um, convener, and thanks um, to Cabinet Secretary and Shelley Rogers for coming along to talk to us this morning. Clearly, um, with all the issues you've got to manage in the health service with the uh, ageing population, uh, etc., the last thing you need is all the additional problems caused by Brexit coming along to, to make things even more difficult. And it's a shame that we um, echo the, the comments of other members. It's a shame we've got nobody from the UK government here to talk to their side of this, uh, this situation, mm -hmm. despite being... Uh, invited and given many, many options for, for different dates. Um, the area I wanted to focus on was around about um, potential impact of future trade deals on, the, on health and social care. Um, we held, heard the evidence, as you'll have seen over the last sessions, um, that uh, the hard Brexit trade deals could potentially restrict the government's ability to take forward um, public health policies. And clearly there's areas around about tobacco, alcohol, challenging obesity, etc., where um, the Scottish Government has got distinctive policies would want to take forward, um, but in a situation where we're a TTIP type deal that could um, we could be dragged into potentially a situation where we're unable to, to pursue those policies. Um, I just want to ask you, do you, you recognise those potential challenges 
and what do you think can be done given that um, we're still in negotiation with the UK government about where we end up around whether there will be consent for common frameworks and what that situation might, uh, might look like? So, I mean, on your, your uh, initial comment about the, you know, the, the worry list, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is in addition to, you know, the challenges we, we already have, which we're trying to uh, address, particularly in workforce, um, this just adds to it in, in spades, and it's a, a far cry from the Leave campaign's uh, claim to benefit the NHS of 350 million a week. Um, so the worry list uh, includes the future trade deals um, and I guess we I mean we wouldn't want to see uh, any mechanisms included in a, a future trade deal such as investor dispute mechanisms uh, allowing private companies to take governments to court or tribunals to stop them implementing public health measures that they feel would damage their uh, businesses now um, we've tried again to seek assurance that any post Brexit trade deals that the UK enters into, that they mustn't open up the NHS to privatisation or endanger public health uh, initiatives. Um, and uh, there was an attempt by, it was actually Vince Cable, to get the Prime Minister to basically rule out uh, opening up the NHS to competition and um, and unfortunately, uh, she uh, didn't uh, do that. I mean, she said that we're starting the discussions with the American administration, first of all, looking at what we can already do to increase trade between the US and the United Kingdom, even before the possibility of any free trade agreement. Uh, the right honourable gentleman does not know what the American administration are going to say about their requirements for that free trade agreement. We'll go into those negotiations to get the best possible deal for the United Kingdom. Um, so um, I don't think that gave any assurance that uh, in her mind or in the mind of the UK government they were setting out with a, with a clear ambition to um, have red lines around these issues. So um, the frameworks then are very, very important in enabling Scot Scottish interest uh, and uh, requiring consent around these issues because uh, if we don't then you could envisage a scenario where um, despite our uh, opposition to having our NHS opened up in that way through a trade deal that didn't have the explicit consent uh, of ourselves or the Welsh, and I know the Welsh have written to the Prime Minister, as I have, expressing concern about this and the lack of, of um, a commitment and, uh, in her response, um, you can see why um, consent is so important because we would uh, otherwise, uh, I think, leave a risk that our NHS here and the NHS in Wales we could be opened up in the same way um, depending on UK government policy uh, on that matter. And I don't think that's a risk any of us want to take, which is why, as I've said throughout the session, consent is so important. Thanks for clarifying that. I think the danger is often that people see the, the debates we have here about um, common frameworks and Brexit and the continuity bill are being, about being something abstract. So it's, it's good to see it firmly rooted in things that are very, very important to people in their, their everyday lives and something as important as the health service. We also heard from the, the Nuffield Trust um, that they felt it was certainly possible to, be able to limit sectors or limit geographies if we're having, um, if the UK government was going forward with trade deals internationally, but clearly, obviously, as we said, that would very much depend on them uh, them signing up and, and, and allowing consent to the uh, to the common frameworks. And they also made the point that the the UK, uh, or the, 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 the health service in the rest of the UK, was significantly more marketised, was the word they used, than it is uh, in Scotland. So, um, is there a risk that we, um, we we do end up seeing a situation where there is uh, there's significant pressure from those trade deals to for Scotland's distinctive health service to become more like the rest of the UK with all that entails? Well, you know, our policy towards the NHS is very, very clear and we would absolutely resist any attempt uh, to, to do that. Um, that's not something 
we would want to see happen to our NHS here in Scotland. So we would do everything possible to uh, avoid that happening. Um, but the best way of, of guaranteeing that is to have um, a, an explicit consent required for ourselves and indeed, as I've said, the Welsh have the, are of the same mind as we are around uh, the protecting the NHS uh, from um, elements of, of these trade deals which uh, would be uh, against the, the ethos of, of how we run our NHS. So um, we would be um, very strong in resisting any attempt to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much Looking beyond 2020, clearly there are many things we cannot currently know. Uh, about the landscape beyond 2020. Has the Scottish Government begun work on issues, for example, uh, uh, replacement of research funding or anchoring of life science companies in Scotland beyond 2020 if we don't have the optimum outcome to the negotiations that you've described this morning? Yes, as you can imagine, a lot of work is going on in scoping various scenarios. Um, as someone once said, it's the unknown unknowns. Um, we, the, the things we do know about, we're uh, obviously uh, working uh, hard on what we anticipate to be the case, working uh, uh, um, both um, Europe and internationally to look at other opportunities. Um, and scenario planning around a number of scenarios, given that at the moment we there are so many unanswered questions as we've kind of I think brought out in this session. Um, but we are scenario planning around all of, all of these and uh, we will do our absolute best to ensure we protect uh, our interests here, whether that's on research, whether it's on the NHS, whether it's on the workforce challenges, uh, to make sure that we, as far as we can, mitigate uh, the impact. But, you know, that is going to be extremely hard to do. Cabinet Secretary, thank you very much, and Shirley Rogers, thank you very much for your attendance this morning. Uh, we will now move into private session, and we will suspend for five minutes. <laughs>